Okay, okay. I think um, okay. Let's give one more minute. Helen, uh, uh, that I see a lot of people that we know here because we've been following. Uh, many of them uh, are following our series and uh, also following us on this club that they set up <laughs> to inform each other. So that's how we get to know about things. Okay, love, because you you uh, you normally have quite a lot of content to share, so I, I will not take any more time. I think we have enough people in here. So welcome again, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for making time. If you are, you've been with us before, welcome back. And if you're new here, thank you for giving this uh, your time for this. And to Dr. Mimi and Dr. Nabila, you have been with us for the past, uh, I think, coming to eight now, coming to six. Yeah, so thank you so much for that because before this, we were looking at the uh, science and technology drivers, but we all know that technology in itself, um, you know, nothing much, there's no value from there because uh, once it's out there, it needs to make that impact and especially to our nation, to our socioeconomy. So this is one of the socioeconomic drivers that we will be diving into. And if you, we, a lot of reference will be made to the 10 by 10 framework, which lines up uh, 10 of socioeconomic drivers, but uh, going with the focus today will be uh, starting with the energy. Uh, those on Zoom, if you have any question, please put them in the chat. Uh, for those following us on Facebook, please put them in the comment section and we will be bringing your questions here for both of the uh, presenters to attend to. So I shall now hand this over to uh, Dr. Mimi and Dr. Nabila Ready to take on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rosalyn, and uh, thank you again, everybody that's uh, joined in. Um, I'll be uh, taking the lead on this one, and as uh, Rosalyn uh, mentioned, uh, yes, uh, the past four weeks, for those of you that have just joined in, I will do a very, very quick recap uh, where my colleague, Dr. Nabila, uh, spoke about uh, some of the technology drivers. I think um, we covered uh, a bit on blockchain, uh, 5G, uh, advanced intelligence system and also 4D printing. She also, I think, made reference to um, some of the research work uh, that's also ongoing in the universities uh, locally. Okay, so um, as, as uh, Rosin mentioned too, um, the, the technology part is one, but uh, today what we're going to do is uh, also explore more about uh, with reference to the MySTIE framework, uh, which is a 10 by 10 matrix. I will um, also run through this very quickly um, and a focus on uh, energy sector. Okay, I will also share with you why is uh, uh, learning about all these different sectors um, a very uh, good place to start innovation projects, all right? So uh, today the, the title is Commercializing Innovation in the Energy Sector, okay? So um, these are some of the things we'll be talking in the next uh, one, one and a half hours, okay? And then um, hopefully I also want to um, have some spare time for question and answers but in the meantime also while I'm presenting if there are things that come uh, to your mind um, put them in the chat and then I'll take a look at it at the end um, of, of my lecture okay not not like live right okay so uh, we'll be talking a bit about the objective um, driving innovation using my STIE social um, economic um, uh, drivers and then a bit about me in the context of the energy sector uh, what have we done at Constellation, a bit about who I am. And then we're going to uh, do, I, I want to share a bit about the energy sector, um, a focus on Malaysia, but also um, what we'll also learn is that the energy sector is very interconnected, uh, uh, mainly because of the grid. Uh, so we're just going to uh, take a look at that too. And then finally, we're going to talk about some of the latest innovation in the energy sector. Um, and as mentioned, uh, Dr. Nabila covered uh, specifically 5G and blockchain, and we're going to talk about some of the um, energy-based projects um, that, that uses uh, 5G um, and blockchain as technology drivers, right? Okay, let me... Okay, sorry. 
Okay, so we're going to go into the objective. So this is the uh, matrix, um, you know, that's uh, been made. Uh, and this is called a 10 by 10 my STIE framework. So what you have on the left side are the different uh, science and technology drivers. Um, I've highlighted in pink the technology that we discussed in the past four weeks. So for those of you that kind of want to, um, uh, you know, kind of catch up about what those are. Now, I think it's very interesting because we spoke about uh, some of the projects that we have done um, featuring all these um, different um, technologies too. Uh, but today, um, as mentioned, um, there's another part of this uh, matrix, uh, which is on the top. And what we're going to be focusing on in the next four coming sessions are in the energy, starting today with energy. Um, next week, we're going to talk about um, social economic drivers um, in the business and financial services, and then medical and healthcare, and also agriculture. Okay, so um, I want to share with you a bit um, about why this um, it's being presented in this way because uh, what the the aim of this my SDIE framework, um, if I may, uh, kind of like help summarize it. it it's a, quite a document, and it's a very interesting document. I highly uh, recommend that everybody um, kind of go and then just Google my STIE, and you can download. It's a very comprehensive uh, document. But what it seeks to do is um, a few things. Okay, so the objective of it is to creatively solve the problem that exists within the social economic sectors as means for innovation. So. Um, just a, a bit of a side information, Dr. Nabila and I, we actually created um, a framework where uh, we now use to teach university students. Uh, Dr. Nabila um, teaches it in UIA, where what we do is we um, discuss um, specifically some of the social economic sectors um, in depth. And then what we get students to do is to identify the problems that exist. Um, and uh, in the second semester after that is where we get them to ideate around the problems that exist within the sectors. Okay, so um, that's a great source of innovation. And um, we'll also see in a while why these are also great, uh, has great economic, um, you know, value when you uh, solve um, or, or innovate within the social economic uh, sectors. All right, second objective is that for those with solution or projects within the sectors, so some of you, um, my colleagues um, at, at the university, for example, you know, they're already working on projects within these sectors. Um, the idea is also to grow through collaboration between the different stakeholders within the sector. So I've got um, one slide later that shows um, a bit about what who are the different stakeholders within the energy sector um, specifically. And um, the, the idea is uh, to also... Um, be aware that these uh, stakeholders and the, these different policy makers, if you may, they exist and then what are the different um, kind of collaboration that you can do with them. Um, finally, to use the social economic sectors' market sizes as a guide for innovation. So what you can do by um, driving innovation through um, my STIE and then uh, specifically into the different social economic drivers is that um, the market sizes within those sectors then become also a guide for um, the potential for commercialization. We'll also take a look at that in a while, right? Okay, so just, just a very quick uh, um, introduction about who I am. Okay, I, I didn't come from the energy sector, but I've done a few things um, um, within the energy sector. And that, that's a bit um, of an introduction I want to do um, about me. Okay, so um, at, at Constellation, we, we founded or we're a venture builder and, and there's two ventures that we have um, specifically um, helped scale up and, um, you know, kind of working um, live. Okay, so this is the first one. This is one of our portfolio companies called Evenergy. Um, so what Evenergy does is it automates the production and trading of um, one instrument called Renewable Energy Certificate. And what we do is we use IoT and blockchain to power up the solution. Um, so specifically, my role was um, developing the idea. So the guy that you see uh, uh, in front of you, Matthias, is a friend um, that I met during my MBA. Maybe uh, an introduction also about my background. I've, I've got a PhD in electronics engineering, and I also went to do my MBA um, after that. So um, Matthias was someone I met uh, during my MBA, and we developed the idea together. Um, I guided the MVP process, so this was something that 
uh, we took uh, from um, his experience being uh, in the energy sector, in the sustainability sector, and we ideated it from scratch. And um, I was uh, kind of like key um, uh, and guided the MVP development process. Um, I architected the um, solution. Um, of course, uh, Dr. Nabila was uh, the one that um, did the blockchain uh, portion at the back. Okay, um, I secured uh, an investment for this project um, and a lot of strat uh, strategic partnership. Uh, I put the team together um, and worked for uh, RE to be taught in the university. So also as a spillover of this project um, and the fact that I, I was uh, teaching at the university, I'm no longer anymore teaching at the university. Uh, but while I was teaching at the university, kind of like what we learned from this experience is also what we took back and taught. Uh, students at the university. Uh, we developed, I think, several courses based on this. So this was my first experience. So um, th th this picture that you see on the right is um, us doing kind of like uh, an international um, collaboration with uh, one of the um, independent power producer in um, in Singapore. So it also cross border. Uh, Matthias was also featured in um, the Edge, uh, for example, for the good work that um, he did. Um, at Eve Energy. Okay, so that, that's uh, one of the projects uh, I did. All right, so there's another project that we did which was uh, quite interesting um, through a company called Regen. Regen is a decentralized energy marketplace where um, accredited buyers and sellers can auction, buy and sell energy units with each other. So this idea was developed. Uh, so what I did was develop the idea into an MVP with the founder. So the founder is uh, Nisha. You can see her um, on the right there. Um, she's American Indian. Uh, she's based out of Texas, um, has more than 15 years of um, you know, experience in the green hydrogen space. Um, and currently, um, Constellation, me at Constellation, we sit on the board of this company and um, we're, we're doing a lot of um, different collaborations uh, together, also still live. Okay, so this is just a bit about me um, and the energy sector. So I'm not going to say that I know um, a great load about it, but um, having, you know, being involved um, in all these projects over the years, I, I um, have a, a bit of uh, knowledge about it. Okay, so... Um, let's get into the energy um, sector um, and I'm going to highlight a few things. So, um, and uh, just for your knowledge too, I, I uh, lectured at the uh, university for uh, a great part of my life, um, you know, so I was juggling between uh, lecturing and um, being an entrepreneur um, for a long time um, and it's only the past six months that um, I've quit uh, doing both and I'm uh, focusing more on um, just venture building uh, now. Okay, so why I'm giving you that is because uh, this is going to sound a bit like a lecture. So lectures, uh, we start with definitions. Okay, so um, before we get into the energy sector, maybe I, I, I when I was doing this slide, I said, okay, you know, we'll take a pause and kind of uh, see what is the uh, actual definition of energy and uh, very simply, energy is actually the ability to do work, okay? So scientists define energy as the ability to do work, okay? Very poetic it sounds. So how do we then, uh, in the engineering school, we take this into the science portion, but here we kind of want to look at um, energy as a sector, okay? So modern civilization is possible because people have learned how to change energy from one form to another and then use it to do work, okay? So... Um, stored uh, chemical energy in coal or natural gas is converted to electrical energy, which can be converted to light and heat. Okay, so why I'm taking this step is because um, there is something called primary energy sources and there's secondary energy sources. Okay, so um, when we talk about primary energy sources, these are renewable or non-renewable energy sources um, that can produce um, useful energy such as heat. Um, or um, these energies that's created by these primary energy sources are converted into producing a secondary energy sources, which is what happened in the case of converting fossil fuels, for example, into electricity and hydrogen. So there is the fossil fuel bit. Um, in a while, we'll see some of the confusion when you talk about energy sector. People are usually like, is oil and gas energy sector? What is the electricity? Why are they all energy and um, kind of like this is where it's um, 
um, it begins. Okay, so when you talk about oil and gas, fossil fuels, for example, these are primary energy sources, and then it gets converted to a secondary energy source um, like electricity and hydrogen. Okay, so when you talk about the energy sector, I, I um, took this picture specifically because I think um, it represents the um, extremely huge, um, you know, um, when you talk about the energy sector, it's huge, okay? Um, and it is defined uh, as um, and the industry that is involved in the exploration, production, generation, transmission, distribution, and consumption of energy, okay? It includes various subsectors such as oil and gas. I mentioned oil and gas. Uh, for those of you that are from oil and gas industry in the room, for example, this is also part of the energy sector, electricity. So in terms of um, big, big giants, um, MNCs or GLCs in, in the country, um, you know, when we talk about oil and gas, the first thing that comes to mind is Petronas. Yes, they're also part of the energy sector, electricity, TNB, they're also part of the energy sector. Um, renewable energy, we're going to see some of the um, various players in the renewable energy and then nuclear energy. So I learned that there are people from um, nuclear. So it's also a source of um, energy. So all these people that's involved in the exploration, in the production, generation, transmission, distribution, and consumption of energy are all within this energy sector. So it's pretty big. Okay. So uh, just to set the stage of how um, uh, vast the things that we're going to uh, be talking about too. Right. So and uh, when I was thinking about this, um, you know, it being so big, um, uh, you know, I kind of um, teaching at the university, you need to simplify things because, you know, you've got a very limited time. So what I did here was uh, look at the whole energy sector value chain. So um, there is there are common elements um, and uh, we extracted that into the energy value chain. Um, there's the exploration bit, as I've mentioned. Um, there is the generation bit, the processing, transmission, distribution, and storage or consumption actually at the end here. And all this is actually um, facilitated um, through several things, uh, which involves um, regulation and policy. We're going to see in Malaysia who are um, actually um, taking care of which bit of the regulation and policy. And there's also the R&D uh, there are the um, government-based R&D. We'll also take a look at that in a while, but also a lot of the R&D work that's happening from the university. Okay, So, um, you know, Maranti does the good work of bringing um, all the different stakeholders together and uh, uh, we're going to look at it um, also in that uh, light. Okay, So when we talk about exploration, um, explore the stage of exploration in the energy value chain is the... Um, identification of the energy sources. So if we're talking about fossil fuel, these are your, um, maybe the charigali or the pre-charigali uh, phase, you know, people are trying to um, identify where are the uh, potential sources. Okay, for RE, um, there are feasibility studies um, that are being done. Um, Dr. Nabila and I also um, have been involved in several feasibility studies of um, uh, we help, for example, Genting Highland answer the question for whether or not um, wind was possible um, as an energy, uh, some energy source um, in Genting. So we, we've done um, something in the exploration side too. Um, generation, this is where the actual building of power plants, including RE power plants, such as solar plants, are um, then, so after you explore, if this is feasible, for example, as I mentioned to you, or oil and gas, in the case of Charigali, for example, identified that this is a potential place, um, what you do is now then building the power plants. The processing is when you get into the downstream, it is in the production of downstream energy products like fuels and biomass. After you've processed it into um, downstream energy product, then you transmit it, okay, the transportation of electricity from power plants to distribution network. Then there is the um, distribution bit. So this is the delivery of the electricity, for example, specifically from the transmission system. So um, when, as you get um, from the downstream um, downwards, uh, you know, the, the, the energy bit um, usually gets um, a bit more, um, electrified, uh, we will see some of the innovation that happens this point forward is also um, where a lot more of the, um, you know, core technology or um, technology, innovative technology bit um, happens, okay? Um, so finally, after the distribution, um, and this is usually uh, where the, um, it, it, 
interfaces uh, from a B2B to C now. Okay, so at the C end, people either store or they directly consume. For us, for example, um, the Malaysians um, in the room, for example, we uh, consume energy, you know, we charge and we put it in the plug point, for example, that, that's one way we consume. Um, but there's also um, a lot of things being done on the storage end, um, and we'll, we'll be talking a bit about that. So, okay, so while everything is huge, it can be summarized into this um, almost value chain. And what we're going to do um, in a while is look at some of the innovation that's um, happening along this value chain, okay? All right, so um, as mentioned uh, be before I go into the, um, you know, some of the uh, real things happening on the, in the energy sector in Malaysia, um, I kind of want to uh, make um, that, uh, you know, kind of like boundary between the energy sector and the electricity sector is that the energy sector is something broader, okay? So um, um, range of energy sources and application compared to the electricity sector. So the electric sector, electricity sector is a subset, if you may, of the whole um, energy sector, okay? All right, so let's take a look at the energy sector in Malaysia, all right? So um, this is based um, of a, a, a pretty recent um, report. Um, I based a lot of this um, discussion today um, on a, a report by um, Irina, um, I will make a reference to that in a while. Also, I can share with you the links if you're interested. Okay, so demand is expected to increase. I don't think this is um, surprising, but just to highlight, um, you know, the quantum of um, increment, I think this is kind of what I want to do here. So by 2050, Malaysia's population is expected to rise, okay, and the economy will nearly triple in size. This is um, what they do um, in terms of uh, projecting the numbers. Um, and the country's primary energy supply will increase by 60% to 6.7 exajoules. <laughs> okay, so um, there is uh, this new term, exajoules, for, um, you know, well, I was also um, pretty, um, you know, new to this um, word exa, at least, joule, we know, all right? So um, maybe just uh, allow me to geek out for one minute. The energy is measured in joules, okay? So when we're talking about energy, we're talking about joules or what hour, okay? So um, th there's always a confusion. I come from the electrical background. Um, when we go into classes, for example, um, students are always confused between power and energy. So power is measured in watts and energy is measured in what hour in again energy is the ability to do work okay so and one exajoules just to give you um uh, kind of like an image um is uh, one is actually the energy consumed by over 28 million average american home um and that is about one fourth or one fifth um the size of the u.s um the, the the size of number of american homes um there are in the u.s so that, that's how big all right uh, our energy demand in just malaysia alone is going to increase to this size uh, times 6.7 and um you, you may be wondering where um, we use and the bulk um, of where we use this energy as uh, shown in this uh, graph is that we use it for um, industrial and transport purposes, okay? So um, industries, um, meaning factories, um, uses uh, a great part, but also um, a big part of it is in transport. So um, that kind of gives you also the idea of why there is a lot of focus on going EV from just a commercialization perspective. This is a huge market potential. Um, and uh, I always tell people why we go for big market potential is because even if you fail, hopefully you'll be able to kind of like, um, or the aim is to make a slither of that big pie, you know, so aligning whatever you're, you're doing um, to a potential a market size of that level, hopefully, um, and then through proper understanding of um, collaborative partner, for example, that, that's kind of what we um, advocate, at least at Constellation, is um, doing things through collaborations. Um, so, if we understand the different partners' needs um, uh, within such a big uh, potential market size, um, you know, there is the potential of successful commercialization. All right, so just to recap quickly, Malaysia's uh, demand for energy in general is expected to increase um, by so amount. And uh, the dilemma that we have um, currently is 
to buy or to go renewable energy. Okay, so um, we have this huge demand and um, you know, people at the, um, I think, ministerial um, level and things like that. So they, they are in between one of two things, all right, to import energy. And um, maybe we think we don't, but we do. Um, so, um, you know, for example, we had we import a lot of LNG um, uh, from um, Qatar, Australia, Brunei, um, because of the marine borders, you know, we, we actually import um, also to supplement um, what we produce, um, LNG, and we also import a lot of crude oil um, uh, from Indonesia and Vietnam around the region, uh, but also the bulk of it comes from Middle East, like Iraq and Kuwait um, in the past maybe, you know. So um, because of this, um, to fill that huge demand, if we are focused on buying, we're going to be subject to volatile international market, you know, so um, things like conflict in the Middle East, for example, is going to affect um, gas price and etc. you know, so this is, um, it, it can quickly become, um, you know, like a sovereign issue, right? So um, the other option is to use renewable energy sources that can provide local and affordable alternatives to fossil fuels. So that's why there is a lot more drive into going into renewable energy sources. So um, this can be seen uh, as we, as I'll share with you in a bit, um, you know, through a lot of the things the government is doing. Um, some of it is rather unconventional, as we will see. So meaning we are at the um, place where we are kind of forced to look at at least um, innovation, you know, and in terms of uh, specifically renewable energy sources and everything, okay? So, and research by um, Irina shows that it is cheaper to use renewable energy sources. And I will share with you um, uh, that, um, you know, why is it that um, not just cheaper, but also um, it, it saves on, on um, a few other things, including externalities, okay? So going RE is cheaper with a combined climate benefit. So to top it all up, going into um, RE is not only cheaper, but it helps um, with a lot of other benefit. So transitioning towards renewable energy will save the country between 9 to $13 billion US dollars annually in um, avoided energy, climate and health costs. So what does this mean is that um, they are looking at it from also um, a term in um, economics called externalities, okay? So uh, let, let's just go through where are all these savings coming from, okay? So directly from the system, RE systems, um, and, and there are two systems, I will describe it to you in a while. So RE systems are in general cheaper, okay, um, as compared to um, things, uh, they, they call this PES. So PES is... Um, um, looking at um, fulfilling the energy demand through um, normal um, sources like coal, etc., and through just projection. Um, but instead, um, they are recommending um, internationally to look at how we can fulfill the energy demand um, that will be in tandem with something called 1.5S. Um, and 1.5S is actually pathways to achieve um, the goals of the Paris Agreement to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial level. So um, j just, um, you know, just to kind of like uh, help you understand um, pre-industrial level is that so what's going on is they're trying to um, build or innovate around um, energy um, sources that can also um, help reduce um, uh, climate um change okay and there are two types of this um energy system one is called the um 1.5 sre100 or 1.5 s90 re90 energy system we'll, we'll take a look at that a bit more closely in a while okay and uh, going re also helps save costs um, in terms of climate and what this is is actually cost related to physical damages caused by natural catastrophes like flood and diversity loss so um the, their, the whole um, uh, focus on ESG specifically, um, uh, you know, in the corporates, I'm not sure if all of you um, have heard of ESG, it's, it's the current buzzword. So why are there a lot of focus on ESG is because um, ESG is the um, kind of the framework that helps corporate 
to quantify something called externalities, whether it is positive or negative. Okay, so um, the inability for uh, profit-making organizations such as corporate or even us SME, SMEs, for example, our books, for example, we don't capture um, this term called externalities. And very quickly, externalities means um, byproducts, if you may. So there are positive externalities and negative externalities. Okay, So positive externalities are, for example, um, a bridge project that um, helps um, increase uh, livelihood um, of people in the um, surrounding town because of this um, um, bridge, you know, people are able to commute between places quickly and therefore promoting um, the economic, um, uh, you know, activities and um, increase in livelihood. Okay, so that's an example of a positive um, externalities. And, and negative externalities are, um, you know, what's being um, said here in terms of um, causing um, nat natural catastrophes like flood, um, diversity loss, etc. Okay, so these are the negative side of it. So what it's saying here is going RE and through this 1.5S RE100 or RE90 energy system, we're going to be able to do both. Save on the energy system itself, but also then save on the um, not having to deal with the negative externalities. Also, in terms of cost, uh, in terms of health, sorry, uh, these are specifically costs related to efforts to reduce outdoor air pollution. So when there is air pollution, um, there's an increase in people going to the hospital, blah, 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 people not being able to go to work, um, etc. You know, so um, it's almost, um, we in Malaysia call it serampang uh, dua mata, right? Okay, to, 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 um, to spear, um, you know, kind of a solution. Okay, so you, the, the, the energy system is cheaper, but it also helps with other uh, climate benefit. Okay, so um, the graph here shows that uh, going RE90 and RE100 um, allows the nation to um, save you know, around 282 billion in terms of just the energy system. So um, this specifically, for example, um, if you're going to compare Apple to Apple, um, just to simplify things, um, making coal-based RE plant versus uh, renew, um, you know, solar, solar powered plant, for example, is going to be cheaper. Okay, so on the other side, saving from uh, reduced um, externalities. Okay, so in terms of... Um, air pollution okay so you're going to be able to save um so much cost also and then um this is kind of like on the low end and this is the high end so at least you're going to um be able to uh, save um 23 to 27 percent and at most um so it's going to be a range of between 23 and 23 to 27 to 49 and 59 percent so th that's uh, a lot okay so um you know, this uh, report is really trying to get us into uh, going RE, okay? So, all right, so just quickly into the 1.5S uh, energy system refers to, so 1.5S refers to the effort as mentioned um, that's agreed to in the, um, in the uh, conference, um, you know, to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial level. And pre-industrial level um, is defined as going back or trying to um, go back into what it was like in terms of climate condition um, and the um, you know temperature before the 18th century before um, industrialization so that that's called the pre-industrial level okay so uh, 1.5s energy system refers to energy system that aligns with both the 1.5 degree scenario for climate change and um, the re100 commitment to sourcing 100 percent renewable electricity electricity or 90% um, renewable. So there are two scenarios um, at the moment. Um, and this specifically, I think, is uh, something that's um, embraced internationally um, through a group. Um, I have a screenshot one um, picture here of a group called the RE100.org. is a growing um, community of um, uh, corporations in the world um, that is committed to going 100% renewable energy. Okay, so all the um, they, they are going, um, you know, 
So what they aim to do is that all their energy comes from purely 100% renewable energy. Okay, so um, and this has been um, embraced by big, big brands like Apple, um, a few of the um, startups that have grown like Airbnb, for example, um, you know, so um, you, you can check this out. Okay, this is at the re100.org. So these are um, guys that are going 100% renewable energy and in the meantime, uh, so, so what they have here is that the target year. So these are, um, you can see that they um, share when are they going to go or when are they expected to achieve 100% renewable energy. And these are what's captured in the target year here. Um, and in the meantime, what they're doing is something uh, quite interesting, uh, which is a combination of uh, renewable energy sources and um, a mix of carbon capture and storage. Okay, so I'm, I'm not sure if you have heard, uh, we will cover um, one innovation in this space in a while. Okay, so um, ca carbon um, capture, for example, or carbon credits, for example, has been um, a word that's been thrown around. But um, with this new 1.5-S, uh, what they're also saying is that um, this the carbon carbon capture carbon uh, credits for example is almost uh, can be seen as a stop gap mechanism okay towards companies going purely 100% re so i'm not sure how feasible that is um um you know we can talk about that uh, later too in the question and answer but um that that's kind of what's happening around the world okay this system would involve um the adoption of renewable energy sources um uh, while striving to limit the uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, situation, or climate situation. Okay, um, so um, there are, uh, as I mentioned, you know, here in Malaysia, that these are a few of the uh, relevant government agencies that's looking at uh, various parts of the um, energy sector. Okay, so there is the Ministry of Energy and Natural Resource, uh, KETSA, who's um, overseeing the overall uh, management and planning of the energy sector. So these are um, including um, generation, um, renewable energy, energy efficiency project. We'll take a look into that in a while too. Um, energy Conservation Initiative. Um, okay, and then there's a second government agency called, um, in Malay, this is ST, uh, so Suranjaya, um, uh, Tenaga or Energy Commission. Uh, so uh, Energy Commission looks into the licensing operation safety standard. Okay, so while um, KETSA gives you an overall plan, so for example, in five years, um, 2025, uh, for example, is when we're going to um, get um, install capacity to be RE of a, a certain percentage, for example, that's announced by KETSA. Um, and EC, what uh, Suranjaya Tec um, Tenaga or um, Energy Commission does is that um, it oversees um, the license and the operation safety standards of um, all the different uh, things that's going to go. So they do that good work because, um, of course, when you talk about energy to um, and electricity, for example, these are extremely high voltage. And so there needs to be a lot of um, governance. Um, there, there needs to be a lot of safety standards. And uh, Malaysia is... I'm actually very, very fortunate in um, the sense that we have a good governance um, in in the form of all these different um, commission, um, commission and ministerial um, involvement. Okay, so uh, Energy Commission uh, looks at that, ensuring compliance uh, with regulatory requirement, promoting fair competition in the electricity market. That's also done by Suranjaya uh, Tenaga. Uh, SEDA is the Sustainable Energy Development Authority um, in Malaysia, administers the various renewable energy incentive uh, program, you know, so um, uh, when we were, um, Dr. Nabila and I, when we were um, doing EVE Energy, for example, um, we read a lot of um, renewable energy power purchase agreements, for example, and um, a lot of the different uh, schemes, you know, like the feed-in tariff is a scheme. Um, as opposed to the LSS, for example, or large scale solar one, two, three, four, and I think now five, um, even, you know, all these are being announced by um, SEDA. So they are the one that um, uh, implements the incentive program. Okay. And the, the reason why the government is doing this is to promote a more um, renewable energy IPPs or independent power producer. Okay. So 
um instead of um and and this is i think if you were to look at um where we're going also as a nation is to um slowly um democratize um you know and i think um in this region the one that's um leading that is i think um singapore um in in singapore you could uh, purchase um electricity from like the way you choose your telco operators you know so there are it's an oligopolic market so um there are four five um you know here in malaysia for example telecommunication um providers we've got four five um telecommunication providers in um singapore there are 11 to 12 for example um electricity providers that you can subscribe and unsubscribe from okay so um when i was showing you one of the collaboration that we did uh, for evenergy it is with one of these um um, operators okay so um the one that promotes these incentive programs in malaysia is uh done through seda okay so we'll, we'll see a bit more about what they're doing too um then there's mgtc malaysia green tech uh, and climate change center this um is more like the nation's r d for um, green technology supports capacity building initiative coordinate national effort to address climate challenge um, change uh, challenges okay so um, this is more like the um, R&D arm for the for the country okay so um, very interesting things um, that they're working on too all right TMB um, is another player that of course everybody knows um, and they are the one basically interfacing directly to the consumer okay so really on the um, you know what is that electricity market okay plays a crucial role in ensuring the reliability stability and affordability of electricity um, supply so we have um, I think um, you know a lot of people I think also in our experience are going to be like and I is that um, a lot of people ask about, um, you know, um, the the uh, energy price or electricity price and things like that. And um, what we uh, don't know is that we are blessed again, um, you know, that our country, um, we highly subsidize because otherwise other parts um, of the world, um, electricity are expensive. Um, but here in Malaysia, you know, these things are still highly subsidized too. So they are slowly trying to um, see um, in, in terms of um, a term is actually a more um, public and private kind of uh, mix, you know. So how do you uh, get um, more um, public involvement towards um, maintaining um, the uh, price of electricity? Okay, so um, that's a lot of the effort too. And and sorry to digress, but maybe just to share something is that um, if you learn from um, the Scandinavian countries, um, how they achieve this is um, through um, having two separate markets uh, for initially um, as you transition into a pure 100% uh, 100% RE um, is uh, utilizing uh, green attributes. Uh, the market, so in, in uh, the RE world, there is the um, ability to kind of parse um, the electricity. So there exists the electricity market, but there exists also the green attributes market, uh, green attribute market, um, which is where your carbon, uh, co uh, carbon credits are. And then um, one of the uh, instrument that we were trying to commercialize um, uh, with Eve Energy called Renewable Energy Certificate. So it's really to use all this different mechanism to kind of help um, the government, um, uh, you know, maintain um, the electricity price offering to the public, but also, um, you know, kind of have a bit more of the uh, private participation. Okay, so you, if you have questions around that, um, I will um, please you know, kind of key that in and I'll take a look at it after um, my slides. Okay, and finally, there is the uh, Malaysia Energy Supply Industry Regulator Act. Um, and this is a legal framework for regulating the energy supply industry in Malaysia. Um, and, and they are really the one that's looking at, I'm guessing, um, you know, uh, drafting the um, PPAs, uh, the power purchase agreements, for example, for the diff various different schemes. So for the FIT schemes, for example, then um, what, what are the, legalities um, around that what is the uh, power purchase agreement um, you know that uh, is being signed between the IPPs and um, TNB for example so um, the regulator within the energy um, supply industry is uh, done through the um, MESI Act 2001.
Okay, so um, so I, I hope, um, you know, kind of like uh, up until this point um, that uh, we're able to see that uh, where we are um, uh, as, a, as a nation, um, demand is going to increase. Um, you know, we are in between um, having either buying these things from um, uh, local partner, um, partners around the world, um, but that is then going to subject us to a lot of volatility or the other one is really gearing up um, on exploring RE and specifically um, RE technologies that are combined with um, climate, um, uh, you know, climate, uh, being able to also track the climate elements to this. Okay, so um, that's uh, what I have uh, for that part. So I hope uh, I'm able to um, kind of paint that. So the other thing um, that's interesting is also on the ASEAN level, um, there is um, an effort called the um, ASEAN Power Grid, APG, which is um, uh, where we as a block, um, you know, um, the ASEAN block is trying to see how um, interconnected grids are able to help um, the entire block as a whole, um, you know, um, in terms of embracing um, sustainable energy sources, you know. So, for example, Malaysia and Thailand has a very uh, prominent um, uh, interconnection, grid interconnection, um, you know, that helps us, for example, um, times when uh, Malaysia has excess um, energy, for example, then to sell and then vice versa. So um, on a, on a um, regional scale, they are also trying to see how we as a block uh, can do this together um, uh, through the um, ASEAN uh, Power Grid uh, initiative. Okay, so um, usually I take some questions now, um, but maybe we'll chuck on and, and take a, a bit, uh, some of the questions in a while. Okay, so um, where, what we're going to do now is look at some of the innovation that has happened along the value, the energy uh, sector value chain um, that I've summarized uh, just now. So, um, and then towards the end, we're going to look at some of the projects um, that has been facilitated by, uh, through 5G and blockchain as a technology driver. Okay, so this is uh, just quickly um, the energy value chain that we've um, spoken about earlier, um, the exploration, generation, process, transmit, distribute, and store, and all this facilitated by the regulation policy and R&D. This is the entire energy um, value chain. And um, so these are some of the, the interesting things that's uh, been happening um, along the 1.5S energy value chain in terms of generation. Um, advanced solar uh, photovoltaic uh, technologies. So um, where um, innovation is going in the um, generation side of things is to um, help if you may capture for a every little surface, you know. So um, I, I took this picture because it kind of um, embodies uh, what they're trying to achieve, I feel. So um if you're from the engineering background, this is called a non-conformal um, surface, you know, so a surface that's not flat. So um, a lot of the research and innovation work is going into um, trying to find a thin, they call this thin film solar cell. Um, and as you can see, um, this is not your uh, rigid um, solar panels, right? This can bend. So it's trying to accommodate for more spaces. Um, I think uh, Dr. Nabila and I, uh, because this is a, a subject we um, teach at uh, the university um, also, you know, in terms of getting, as I've mentioned earlier, in terms of getting students to ideate um, around a problem. Um, and, and we've got people from TNB, for example, coming to say that, well, we can only put in certain kind of rooftops uh, when, it, uh, when they're talking about uh, the net metering or the NEM. Um, scheme, you know, for households to have a solar panel. So uh, we had students, for example, that uh, comes up with the idea of, um, you know, even your blinders to be um, solar panels, you know, and they're not wrong about it, you know. So they, they found that um, a lot of the apartments, for example, you know, um, that has a lot of direct sunlight in the day, if you could, for example, instead of have it, curtains, for example, so their proposed solution is to um, incorporate this thin film solar um, cell as, um, you know, part of the curtain solution for apartments. So 
we're we're really trying to get students at the um, university level to really think outside the box um, um, about how they can then work on projects along um, these kind of problems. Okay, so um, UKM has a Solar Energy Research Institute, um, and and I think there are a few um, active researchers that are. Um, researching specifically on thin film solar cells so that that's a uh, one uh, part of um, innovation um, along the uh, value chain and specifically in the generation side um, also there is um, a lot more projects on floating solar um, so recently as recent as just a few months ago there was this news um, um, that Malaysia uh, launches a 30 megawatt uh, floating solar tender so this is one uh, we, we spoke about the various agency and these are some of the schemes uh, you know as, as I've mentioned um, in the past um, there has been a lot of uh, different schemes like uh, large-scale solar um, scheme um, LSS it's called abbreviation um, one two three and four for example so this is um, another scheme um, where TNB uh, has started actually accepting um, application for the development of um, AC floating uh, photovoltaic plant um, and uh, these plants um, it, coming back to the 1.5 S energy system um, these uh, floating plants do several things um, which is quite um, interesting is that um, in terms of cooling, the water underneath it is um, also helping with um, cooling the uh, solar panel um, solution, you know. So, um, and, and this is um, interesting for specifically uh, regions with uh, limited land, um, shallow coastal waters and um, to, to expand the potential of renewable energy. So if um, you don't have lands, for example, there, there's a lot more um, emphasis on uh, floating um, solar. I think we have one or two projects um, in, in Cyberjaya um, that also um, has a, a floating um, solar as a solution. Okay, so that's one um, innovation that's happening, um, er, er, you know, along the value chain. Um, another one, and specifically in terms of the storage, um, there is this um, um, focus on something new called the solid state batteries. Okay, so um, I think we are all familiar with lithium ion. And I, I think for those of you that are, are my background is uh, not really um, also from uh, the chemical, but... Um, I think Dr. Nabila has a project uh, that she did with the university along um, energy storage um, using um, super or ultra capacitor, if I'm not mistaken. So um, maybe she can help answer some of those questions later. But one of the key difference um, with lithium ion batteries and the solid state batteries is that uh, lithium ion batteries are uh, uses some kind of a still a liquid solution okay as opposed to the solid state batteries um that has uh, or uses um ceramic uh, ceramic as one of the um you know like a solution for uh, for the batteries and what this helps with um essentially is a longer battery life but also um it helps with um keeping uh, the battery safe okay so um so much so that um again as recent as just a few months ago toyota um teams up with um idemitsu uh to mass produce all solid state batteries so a lot of um, um emphasis on going into solid state uh, batteries uh, especially if you're looking into um the transportation um solution bit okay so um and and i'm pretty sure that soon um the same kind of solution is going to be um used also for for example um storage for um electricity generated in the house etc you know so instead of um having a lithium ion based um solution there is a, a focus on the solid state batteries okay there's also um, a lot more energy density. The um, is, I'm I need to understand that um, it's also um, prolonged the life. Uh, so if, if um, I'm not sure lithium ion batteries life, but uh, solid state uh, batteries um, both a uh, higher uh, lifespan. Okay, because of the uh, charging and discharging. I think there are formal terms to all this. Um, 
uh, I'm not an expert in uh, battery technology, so uh, I, I'm going to leave it to uh, the question and answers. And I, as I've mentioned, uh, maybe some of these things uh, Dr. Navila can help with formal terms. Okay, so in terms of the consumption, um, there is a more focus on smart buildings and energy management system and specifically energy efficiency projects. Okay, so um, a lot of the um, new um, buildings that's being built uh, in Malaysia, KLCC being one, um, Im already implements a smart building. And what smart building does is um, the ability for it to um, switch off or adapt to, uh, to to the condition. Okay, so there is a, uh, it is actually the integration of um, a lot of sensors um, that detects, for example, occupancy and um, automating um, real uh, automating things like, for example, if you know it's a rainy day and it's not so hot, and that um, the optimal um, uh, you know, temperature in the room um, is 25 to 26, for example, to be comfortable because some, sometimes it's absurd, right? Some some offices, for example, is extremely cold uh, where you actually have to uh, bring in sweater and the irony is that outside is extremely hot. So this idea of um, what is the optimal comfortable um, temperature for Malaysian, for example, and then the ability for the entire HVAC system to then uh, adapt to that. Okay, so there, there is a lot of sensors involved and um, uh, coming coming back to uh, technology drivers, you know, um, sensors, when you think about sensors, that, um, that's kind of where you think about 5G. Okay, we'll look at 5G specifically in a while and some of the startups are working on um, interesting uh, solution. Okay, so there is this uh, real-time analysis, um, optimization of energy um, usage, um, you know, so if the sensors, for example, are then also linked uh, to um, energy efficiency uh, kind of mechanism of the HVAC, um, for example, then um, it, could, it could really uh, come together and save a lot of um, electricity. So these projects um, are categorized um, under the energy efficiency project. Um, there is also um, a lot more um, innovation going into making these solutions also very um, beautiful. Okay, so I took this picture out of Pinterest. Uh, smart glass walls and um, skylight. Okay, so um, the ability to um, adapt uh, in terms of the material itself. So I think uh, Dr. Nabila some weeks ago spoke about 4D printing, for example. It's not exactly the same, but it's kind of the same idea that um, the material then adjusts to the ambiance, you know. So when it's a bit lighter, then uh, the gradient of the um, uh, walls and uh, windows, for example, then uh, goes a bit higher and, and provides a bit more... Um, of a darker space, but then uh, when when night comes, for example, then um, these materials would then adjust and then um, makes it um, a bit more transparent that you can then see the stars, for example. Okay, so uh, Maida uh, in Malaysia is um, going to invest uh, 13 billion ringgit um, by 2040 to improve energy efficiency. So uh, coming back to commercialization, if you have... Um, you understand this space well, for example, there's also a lot of money um, um, that's being, um, you know, kind of uh, investment. So um, people invest um, to achieve a certain target. So um, the, the the country through MIDA is investing in this. Um, you can see that they are uh, putting in a lot of money in this space um, and, and we will see in a while why. Okay, so... Um, that's another one. So, all right, uh, maybe just to um, summarize some of the um, technologies and investment, uh, we haven't covered the, so what I'm going to do next is we're going to talk about some of the innovation projects um, uh, that utilizes blockchain and uh, 5G. Um, and if you can see here that um, in terms of investment um, and then the uh, map to the technologies and the, uh, you know, different uh, kind of um, projects, okay? So, uh, in terms of uh, why I highlighted the end use sectors is that the total investment um, out of the um, entire list, um, a lot of it is actually focused on the end use. Okay, so um, really on the consumption side, um, arguably also on the storage. Um, well, storage has a has a 
a category by itself. But um, this is on the consumption side. And, and we will see in a while um, how 5G and blockchain actually um, facilitates mostly this part of the um, sector or of the entire energy value chain, you know, so um, and use sector. So um, there are a lot um, of investment that's been put in. I think um, the second highest here is actually in the solar PV. So um, for those that are working on, um, you know, the thin film um, uh, kind of um, solar initiatives, etc., a, a lot of money is also going into that. Um, and the aim is to have um, this much of um, energy driven by solar um, by 2030. So I think um, this is um, the most out of the three types, uh, solar, bioenergy and hydropower. Um, a lot of um, money and a lot of um, focus is being put onto um, what's called the installed capacity. So meaning how much energy is actually in the grid to be driven by um, solar PV. Okay, so investment of about ten point eight billion dollars. Um, but still, um, energy efficiency and um technologies that facilitate or targets the end use sectors. Uh, so that means it's a B two C kind of solution. Or if it's a B two B, then it's got to be a B two B two finally C, as opposed to, for example, solar PV and um, you know, if you look at the other side, um, all the other um, components on the uh, value chain, um they could arguably be B2B, right? But the end use sectors is when it is actually a B2B or a B2C directly or a B2C. So um, a lot of focus here. Okay, so... Um, sorry. Okay, so some innovative solution using uh, blockchain and as I've mentioned in the consumption space, um, there is a, a focus on decentralized energy trading platform. Um, and what this is and how um, it's facilitated by blockchain is um, so how it works is that blockchain based platform enable decentralized peer to peer energy trading among what's called as a prosumer. So prosumer is actually a combination of a producer and consumer. Okay, within local energy communities. Um, and so these platforms allow users to buy, sell, and trade uh, renewable energy directly with each other, fostering um, renewable energy adoption and supporting the integration of distributed energy resources into the grid. So um, this idea of decentralized energy trading um, is um, something that's being uh, talked about. I think I, I first um, hear this, um, you know, like four or five years ago that people are already talking about it. Uh, but one of the more um, active um, and, and uh, uh, a, a lot of uh, startups um, was trying to enter this space um, from my observation beginning maybe four or five years ago, but one that has actually uh, quite successfully done it is... Uh, uh, one startup they're based um I'm, I'm not sure where they're based out of um uh, are they really in uh, Singapore or things like that um maybe Dr Nabila can help me too but we've come across Power Ledger for quite a bit and Power Ledger is a blockchain based energy trading platform um that does precisely that um you know enables peer to peer trading of renewable energy um among producers and consumer Okay, um, and has implemented this project worldwide, including Australia, the US, and also Thailand. So um, it's this um, very interesting idea of, it combines to the idea of a P2P, but also a microgrid. Um, we will see in a while what is meant by a microgrid. So the idea that you can set up independent um, community of um, power, um, you know, so so imagine uh, uh, it's also combined with another big word called a virtual power plant. Okay, so the idea that um, a community has its own um, energy solution, if you may, in terms of production, distribution, etc., and that um, days that um, me, for example, as a as a house, um, I'm not in, for example, but but my solar panel is generating something, and um, let's say one of you, your house is within that same uh, locality or that same community. I can then sell the excess because I'm not using it to you. So in that way, um, there is optimization of the energy utilization, but there is also um the um. Uh, ability to kind of keep it contained rather than always demanding sources from the main grid, you know. So um, 
uh, the, the main grid, um, you know, how it currently works is that you generate, for example, our um, dam, for example, somewhere, you know, our big, um, uh, you know, big generation of energy, for example. And then what happens is that it gets transported from that part all the way to your house, essentially through, of course, you know, uh, various um, technology they've got to step up um, and then step down so a lot of power losses in this uh, transportation of energy so um, what this kind of platform and specifically um, this kind of um, startups and solution is trying to do is then um, increase the efficiency of um, how you manage energy by facilitating um, a more communal um, solution to um, energy generation, energy, um, so, um, you know, usage, and also the trading between each other. So uh, check out Power Ledger. Um, they run on blockchain. I'm not sure which blockchain they're running on. If it's not Ethereum, um, again, maybe that's also something that Nabila can comment on. Okay, so um, this is one very, very interesting um, thing that's happening. Um, and I think um, coming back to just trying to make it um, around the region, um, this is what... Uh, I think um, Singapore, for example, is uh, aiming to do through their um, P2P energy uh, marketplace. Okay. Okay. The second innovative solution using blockchain, um, and again in the consumption um, um, side of the value chain, is a, a supply chain transparency and carbon footprint tracking. Okay. So. Um, there is um, a lot of problem. I'm not sure if you've uh, come across um, this word called greenwashing. There's a lot of, um, um, when you talk about carbon credits, for example, and using uh, green attributes uh, like uh, carbon credits and renewable energy certificate, um, all these uh, buzzwords um, that's helping with uh, corporates, ESG, for example, there's a lot of um, issues around um, greenwashing and also transparency. So the carbon market, um, this is uh, what we are um, trying to solve um, using Eve Energy is that there's a lot of opaqueness, you know, and what we mean by that is that um, a lot of the carbon credits that get sold in the market, um, we don't know where its origin is because um, usually who sells this um, is... Um, uh, someone who um, works on assessing the supplier and the carbon uh, credit uh, production and then he then keeps inventory of all this um, he does an audit and he keeps an inventory and then sells it to whoever that wants to buy but his operation remains quite opaque in the sense that um, it's not automated um, and in the past, um, this is, uh, you know, um, it, it's simply because there was no technology, but with a technology that combines, uh, again, IoT and, um, and IoT, of course, uh, runs on 5G um, and uh, blockchain, what people are able to do now is go down right to the sources um, and really um, use uh, some kind of uh, um calculator or, or a tracking mechanism um, and then uh, putting this uh, or tagging each one of these carbon uh, credits um, and for, for sale or for trade, you know. So uh, CarbonX is one such company. Um, it's a blockchain-based platform that enables companies to um, track, manage and offset their carbon footprint. Um, it integrates carbon accounting tools, smart contracts and uh, carbon offset marketplaces. Uh, to measure emission, um, identify reduction opportunities, and um, also then uh, facilitate the, the trade uh, between. So, for example, if you are, um, you know, that that guy that um, operates the floating solar panel, for example, um, and uh, inadvertently or also by the side while generating electricity, you're also generating um, a carbon um, uh capture or carbon uh, credits, um, then the carbon credit bit is uh, what Carbon X then helps tag and um, facilitate trade between whoever that just wants to buy the carbon credit um, with the um, original owner. Okay, so um, very interesting. Um, okay, we can, we can, if you have uh, more questions around that, also we can um, take some questions around that. Okay, so... Um, uh, one innovative solution using 5G. So what I'm trying to do here is highlight some of the technology 
um, drivers that are facilitating this um, social economic driver in the energy sector specifically. Okay, so um, as mentioned, um, 5G is um, another um, technology driver um, that's uh, helping also again um, along the entire energy uh, value chain, but specifically this one in terms of the distribution. And distribution, again, just to remind you that distribution is where um, the energy is then, um, you know, kind of distributed into the, um, if you may, municipality level before it actually goes down into the consumer level. Um, okay, so how 5G helps with this is um, specifically through something called Smart Grid. Um, and what, what Smart Grid, uh, what is Smart Grid is, um, um, is the uh, grid or the, um, network um, that has an enhanced um, efficiency um, and reliability and uh, resilience of um, distributing. So um, it does something called load balancing. It facilitates something called load balancing. So um, I'm, I'm by training um, also a telco engineer. Um, so we talk a lot about, um, for example, all traffic. So um, there is also that same idea in terms of road, you know. So when you travel, for example, um, to KL in the morning, for example, to get certain places, um, you know, going one way, like for me, for example, Ampang to KLCC, for example, or Ampang to KL, for example, you know, um, in the morning is crazy to go through Jalan Ampang. But if I go now or eleven o'clock in the morning, yeah, you know that that. Uh, road is going to be empty but um, in the morning for example a few more solution gets presented to me I could take the Akle for example so there is the idea of balancing the load towards getting some certain thing. so what smart grid does is um, it is able to detect uh, the kind of um, demand from a certain place and respond through it through um, an optimized search for what is the available route you know so to to deliver this so um this is um called specifically load balancing as i've mentioned um so what 5g does is is it facilitates real time um monitoring control that's number one you need to be able to um know what is the current uh, what is the demand etc um and optimize of a uh, grid uh, operation um and and this over, um in general reduce um, energy losses improve load balancing so um, the wear and tear of the um, facility or the infrastructure is also then, um, you know, um, you can save on that because uh, the wear and tear is also something that happens when you um, overload a certain system. Okay, so um, one um, interesting um, startup, they're, they're based out of the US um, and they're called Clean Spark actually and MVolt is one of their solution. Um, so MVolt uh, enables a system to use um, power generated from multiple sources um, and, um, you know, supports the um, storing of the energy during disruption um, and when all economic opportunities uh, exist to then um, sell this back towards the grid. So there is this idea of uh, monitoring the entire energy utilization, um, starting from the source, the demand, and then also becoming a supply. Okay, so um, what Envolt does is it connects um, a household to um, all the different sources. So for example, if you have your source from um, your utility company in the form of TNB, for example, but you also have a, uh, a solar in, a panel installed um, at your rooftop, for example. So um, when nobody's at home, you know, there is access to that. And when there is access, then um, what Envolt does is it stores this access into um, a battery um, or a storage kind of solution. When there is surplus, so for example, if you come back and you don't use this over a certain threshold, what it does is then it facilitates also the sale or you can then sell this um, energy either back to the grid or around the um, community community that uses um, the, the solution to. Okay, so this is um, um, a smart kind of distribution and um, facilitated by 5G. Okay, so where 5G comes into um, uh, work here is that all this different uh, communication between all the different um, parts of the 
um, energy storage, for example, you know, to, to know how much energy is stored. So um, a lot of machine to machine kind of communication is what um, 5G is best at. Okay, so um, I, Dr. Nabila and I, we, we um, like to joke about it um, in the form that, um, you know, if we, uh, we make calls, but machine make calls to through uh, using um, eSIM or, or um, you know, a 5G um, kind of solution. Okay, so um, check this guys out, uh, Clean Spark. Um, and then finally, I think I've come to my last slide, actually. Um, I also kind of want to um, have a bit more um, interaction, uh, listen to some of your questions and also share, um, you know, what we've been doing too. Okay, so um, there is this um, a smart building um, uh, solution. So uh, one uh, such um, um, startup, um, but I think I think they've uh, suffered quite a bit. Uh, this uh, startup called Building IQ, um, and here it is uh, the idea of using five G powered smart building solution to optimize uh, energy consumption. So as I've mentioned earlier, you know, so using five G. Um, um, again, uh, to, if you have sensors, for example, in the in the room, um, you know, ability to detect, for example, um, temperature, um, also ability to detect um, luminosity or how much light you need in a room. If this is a reading room, for example, you need a certain kind of um, brightness, for example, and to be able to then um, link that directly back to um, HVAC system, uh, lighting controls, for example, um, to um, help deliver the optimal um, kind of uh, situation. So um, for those of you that has a Google um, solution in your house, for example, so it's it's a, a smarter Google Nest, if you may, you know, so some, some uh, uh, the ability to uh, directly detect that, okay, this is labeled, for example, these sensors are in the reading room. Um, it needs this kind of cooling system if it's in the morning, for example, this kind of, um, you know, brightness uh, for people to be able to read, blah, 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 and then to auto adjust as opposed to, um, you know, your Google Nest um, uh, or your Google Home, for example, what it does now is that it takes command uh, by you. Okay, so the, the next level is actually um for these um to be able to uh, also be automated you know so these are some of the things that's facilitated um using 5g because what it needs is um an autonomous kind of communication so this sensor um when it reaches a certain threshold for example in terms of brightness that um it automatically sends a little um communication um with the main um, hub, for example, to then um, also then that hub then yeah, notifies the HVAC system to then um, recalibrate things. Okay, so um, I think that's all I have um, from um, Constellation uh, and in terms of the energy sector. Um, and I would like to um, thank you uh, for listening. That was uh, a lot. Okay, so... Um, I hope to take some questions and uh, yeah. Okay, so we'll go to Q&A um, and uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, there was quite a bit, but uh, if anyone has missed maybe the earlier portion of it or you, you can make Let me check the chat. Okay. I'm just uh, checking the chat yeah. now. Uh, you can watch the replay of this. Oh. On Facebook, uh, it will be at the Maranti page, and uh, just click on the videos; it will be there. And that is also where you will find the previous webinars. I think we have done four on the uh, science and technology drivers. Two of which uh, Dr. Mimi shared here: blockchain and five G. That we had two more previously, and then you can go watch to the page and uh, watch it there again because. Um, there was someone who was asking about your deck, uh, the slides. Um, if we get that, yes, we can share, but we probably would advise you to watch this uh, webinar again uh, on Facebook. Uh, yes, Doc, we, have, do, we do have one. Yeah. At the beginning. Um, yes. 
I, I'm just going through your chats. Uh, keep them coming. Um, okay. There is one from uh, Mariam um, that talks about entrepreneurship. Um, was yes. There was one before that. Uh, that's from Raja Surya. And sure. that one came from Facebook. Okay. There's another one. The rules and regulation that has been in place for the last 50 years, and this has to be regulated by regulators without adopting uh, too fast technology. I'm to address yeah. it. Yeah, there's more and... question for you, Rosie. <laughs> uh, Raja Surya, um, how is the <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, so that would be yes, probably. Um, I, I have Raja Surya, uh, thank you for that question. We have captured this, and uh, I do believe. We don't have enough time to be talking about yeah. this uh, yeah. as a whole. But yes, there are... Yeah, uh, more, more related to energy, right? So there's one yeah. by Pritesh. Maybe I'll take this one first. Yeah, yeah. But I'll anyway, just, just yeah. to address Rajasurya here, yeah. uh, on, on matters like this, there are 11 sandboxes that have been set up uh, by our National Technology and Innovation Sandbox. Throughout the years, I think we're coming into year four. And uh, you can find this at NTIS. But yes, the energy sandbox is yet to be developed. We are looking for the right partners for this. And we do, because we do recognize that for innovations uh, that are new and uh, most innovations going by the name alone has never been done or tested or trialed before. So we do need that playground for these technologies and innovations to be tested. So there are sandboxes already for some of the uh, technologies out there. Please go and check out the NTIS website on this. I think it's ntis.gov.my. We'll put it in the chat. But we do note your questions. Um, the the uh, regulation, the, the purpose of the sandboxes there are uh, just for the and for the energy sector, once there are plans for that, we will make that known to everybody here. Okay. All right. We'll go ahead. Okay. With the next no, 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 no. Thanks, uh, Rosie, for uh, helping clarify that. Uh, exactly. There are sandboxes. And um, yeah. So there's a, a good question by Pritesh um, retrofitting um, an opportunity to save up to 40%. Yes, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of a retrofitted uh, solution personally. Um, I, I believe um, there is a lot of um, uh, benefit um, and specifically in terms of energy if you retrofit such things. So I, I'm uh, curious as to um, if you've tried to explore collaborating um, with anyone, um, maybe you can drop me an email. I, I could think of one or two kind of collaborations that you can do um, towards um uh, promoting this solution um, and what, what you have is quite interesting because it's kind of at that um, juncture of mixing um, architecture and almost energy efficiency. So um, if you'd like to talk more about it, uh, you can look me up on LinkedIn or whatever, um, you know, we, we can talk about some ideas maybe, you know, so uh, awesome stuff. Congratulations on that. Okay, so I'm just uh, making my way down to solar panel and LED bulb um, save electricity. Mm, uh, I think solar panel generates electricity. Uh, B, you have <laughs> some comment. Yeah, I mean, correct. That's what I mean. I mean, solar panel is just uh, you are providing an alternative to the electricity rather than coming from the grid, which we know that about fifty percent coming from coal. So solar panel is um alternative green source of energy. As for the LED bulb, is more efficient than the normal uh, other light source. It converts more, I mean, more electricity into, into light. So, yeah, and it consumes less power. So that's how, I mean, if you look in terms of saving the electricity, it's actually more like using mm -hmm. less electricity to provide the, the same, same. Uh, light requirement. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nabila. Uh, there is a, a question from Zarif, uh, ZetaNet um, commercial. The different current system is running with 2G and 4G. How can we start with 5G? Um, yeah. So uh, the difference between um, 2G and 4G and uh, the main thing with 5G is that there are uh, there is the um, idea of eSIM. 
uh, yeah, or, or uh, be anything to act with. So, uh, how do you um start with five G? Is that I think um you need to explore the providers that are providing for um, machine to machine or provide e team that can be incorporated into your devices. So um, that that's how you use 5G for um, machines, you know. So 5, 5G is great at that because it facilitates, uh, um, you know, kind of like an autonomous um, little communication, not, not too different from if you're, um familiar with the telco um standards uh the zigbee for example is another one that's uh quite similar to what i'm imagining you're trying to do here okay so um and and also there there is this um there is uh, at least Dr. Nabila and I, when we teach, um, you know technology entrepreneurship um in the university uh we really ask or get the students to answer the question of why do you want to jump into a certain technology? What is the, um, kalau bahasa Melayu dia kekangan, eh? So what is the limitation that you're facing? Constraints. Uh, constraints. <laughs> Thank you, Rosaline. Okay, yeah. So what, what are some of the constraints that you're facing with 4G um, or the current communication um, system? Um, and then we explore what's out there to kind of help you around Okay, so hope uh yeah, hope I answer. Okay, so from Facebook, Cyril, John Matthias, what is Malaysia focus and strategy on hydrogen fuel cell? Yeah. Um, I think um in Sabah and Sarawak, um there, there's a bit more talks about hydrogen fuel cell. I think Sarawak has uh buses that are uh, powered by hydrogen. Um so there is, but I think um in we're, we're quite at the extremely early stage um that company um i mentioned uh, we work with um, um is uh, going into hydrogen but um they're exploring it from singapore and then us so here in malaysia it's, it's still quite nascent and rcc scheme with what blockchain that have been pre presented on carbon credit exchange what is your opinion on nrcc scheme it's a UNF. Oh, sorry. Uh, UNFCCC. Apa? Uh, what is that? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not sure what is this. Uh, scheme with no, blockchain that have been presented on carbon credit exchange. Yeah. Um, I can say on carbon credit exchange, but UNFCCC. Okay. Um, I'm going to have to look that up. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Got it here. It's a United Nations framework. Work Convention on Climate Change. Okay. Um, yep. With what blockchain that has been presented? Yep. Um, I think in general, uh, blockchain will help with transparency in general. Yep. Okay. So that is always a, a good point for the UN level. Uh, but there is a lot more um, other, other things that come into play. Yes, UN might support, for example, but... Um, you don't know how it's going to be accepted by all the other different players and specifically the corporate side, okay? So it's a great technology, actually. If you're just going to look at it from um, a utility point of view, definitely is something that's great. Okay, I hope I answered your question, Najib. We took note and we bring this for discussion. How might quantum computing benefit a startup focus on improving energy forecasting? Energy... Um, Quantum computing, are these specific quantum algorithms that could be game changers in this area? Um, yeah, um, thanks, Mama Hilmi. Um, I, I think, um, again, um, maybe it is trying to articulate the problems that you, you want to solve, um, what kind of um, energy forecasting you're trying to do. Um, quantum computing is uh, beneficial for um, extremely large uh, kind of processes okay so that that's the main uh, thing about quantum computing so uh what is it that the current um frameworks or mainframes um, cannot do such that you know quantum computing is the one to solve this problem i'm not so sure but just to tell you very um superficially quantum computing helps process a lot of um input be anything to add yeah maybe i mean in terms of the quantum computing the way i can see how it can help with the energy because we are now transitioning into the renewable energy which 
highly depending on weather you know if you can improve on the weather forecast so you can see i mean on certain area how much electric electricity you can generate from solar from wind so if you can do that kind of predictions then you can predict how much renewable energy can be generated and can help manage the grid so i think that one area because like com uh, quantum computing can really helps in terms of the weather forecasting because right. you have like huge data on weather on that and i think malaysia still need to improve on the weather forecast as well so i think yeah quantum computing can make it play a big role in that sense yeah hey i know we need to forecast our weather like by the second <laughs> yes <laughs> by the second well, because we can't use 24 hours for the eight hours yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I there's one more question if if you allow me uh okay maybe maybe this is the last question okay so how do we save energy in telecom tower which are in thousand country what yeah um i think uh pritesh um quantum tower has uh an re um solution so i i think um there's a great um a, a large portion that is powered up by um some kind of a solar panel um, solution okay uh, so maybe before we go and uh, you know on on behalf of um, Ranti and I don't want to forget this bit okay so uh, please um, help leave us some feedback so that uh, I can also improve um, you know and and help uh, meet some of um, your expectations from these sessions too okay so yeah. While while you do that, I'm just gonna give one more round to see if we miss anybody. Um, this one I'm not sure whether there's a one on how about saving energy for existing buildings which are more than ten years old. Oh, uh, retrofit you you address that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I miss any anything? No, I, there's none on FB also. Okay. Before we go off, uh, just a shout out here to, um, I think, hang on a second. Um, yeah, to Mariam. She's a lecturer at a private university. And, and the challenge of this, incorporating entrepreneurship in the syllabus. I think a lot of our lecturers here also and university as, as uh, everywhere that comes from their own initiative to see that uh, element um, entrepreneurship or that DNA for entrepreneurship in all of especially science and technology uh, faculty. Indeed. So I would salute you on that because uh, it does technology, science, technology and innovation do need uh, a, co a community of cooperation and at the end of the day it's always the business of the science and technology because without that the impact is it's very hard to get. Yeah. And that might take a long time. And they may not even feel the need of the people out there. So uh, let's continue this conversation because we will be having another webinar on this. Uh, I think I believe that will be on the 7th, I'm not sure. But do check out our website and our social media, LinkedIn, because the next uh, social economy dri uh, economic driver that we will be looking into will be, be financial services. And after that, <laughs> follow us up. I saw that. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> Financial services, uh, followed by uh, agriculture, of course, and healthcare, medical and healthcare, because that is what the world needs right now. I'm sure there's a lot of you in this space also. Um, same for energy that's really coming up. Uh, the world's changing. We need to change as fast as somebody was saying here to catch up regulation and all that. But innovation can't stop. So we do need to go out there and do things well. Uh, we figure out how to manage that. And we just can't wait for one after another. One last round here. I saw two managers. Uh, how do we collaborate with Humaranti? I think one of you have already connected with us. We already got your details. Um, happy to have you here asking us that question. And uh, how can Sandbox add value to our e, e projects? Um, not a question I can answer right, right now. There are there is a team who will be able to support you on this. 
Uh, all you need to do is if you can find me on LinkedIn, I will capture this here right now. Ellen Ho, I have your details if you are registered to this uh, session. And also, I don't know what CTS and CBH and is your name is, but I hope to find your name in the registration so we can get back to you. I'm not sure whether there's another colleague of yours that's here that we will get in touch with. And um, so that's why we do this session so that we can get people out there on board with us on this. So thank you so much again. We'll see you on the next one, uh, looking to financial services. Uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Nabila, Dr. Mimi for being here. You, you do know you're going to be here for another like eight or seven years. Yes. yes okay. Yes. <laughs> so uh, We look forward. Yeah, yes, I do too. And I hope oh. everyone's here. Those mm -hmm. on Facebook. Facebook, thank you for joining us there. So uh, we'll see you around. And um, hang on, I may want to share this another one with you. There is a club. They call themselves the Maranti Coffee Club. Not set up, set up by us, but by one of you also, because we would like this con conversation to continue. So give me a few seconds here to get the link where you can join us there. Um, hang on a minute. Let me find that. So um, this was said by our, our alumni who have been following our webinars, workshops, and boot camps. And uh, we had a workshop last year where we brought everybody together and they thought, they believed that they need to keep in touch with each other. And hence, they uh, set up this Mm. Okay, it's the link here. One second. Oh, okay. Need this to happen. Right. Okay, okay. There it is. I will put here in the chat. So if you can give, uh, take one or two or three seconds here to copy that and join us there because Dr. Dr. Mimi and Dr. Nabila and all our previous speakers will be there also and uh, the attendees uh, of this. And so will I. Okay, And uh, we'll see you again. Thank you so much. Have a good lunch and uh, stay safe out there. Mm -hmm. See you then. Bye. Thank you for your feedback. Keep them coming. Bye. Thank you everyone back and we'll see you again. Bye. Bye. Bye.